My government continues to deny. Shroud. Hey guys, Pete here. Today I thought I'd do a video looking at the changes the TV series made in adapting Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. There's been a lot of somewhat heated discussions and mixed reactions about the adaptation, so I thought I'd get down what actual changes they made. I won't go deep into some things because I don't want to spoil the big picture, but with that said, there are definitely spoilers from the first two episodes, so if you haven't watched them, then this video won't be for you. Whether you're new to the series or it's just been a while since you read it, this should cover the important parts and filter out some of the noise. Noise that I should say isn't surprising. Foundation is a series that has been popular for a long time, and that means that people do have expectations. And then you also have some groups that are always present on the internet, especially with something like this, in my experience anyways, as someone who has to read a lot of YouTube comments. You have the people who see everything through the cultural war lens, who tend to get upset about things like representation and diversity, and then you have people who love the source material to the point of being purist in that they don't want to see any changes at all. So yeah, none of that's surprising, but it also isn't specific to Foundation, so it doesn't really say much either. I guess I was more surprised at the amount of people saying it doesn't resemble Asimov's original work at all. Partially because the author changed a lot of things himself when he revisited the universe to write the prequels and sequels. When he merged it with the Robot series, he altered several fundamental ideas that reflect how his thinking on things had evolved. And then I guess what's more important for this video, I found it surprising because the actual events of the first story, the psychohistorians, were mostly intact, especially Harry Seldon's introduction and his trial. And I suppose that's the best place to start since that involves Gail Dornick, who's a character that embodies both sides of the argument. On the one hand, her role in relation to the plot is almost identical, at least in the very beginning. And on the other, she's kind of connected to all the different changes we see in one way or another. So the most obvious thing about Gale that's changed for anyone who's read the series is that Gal Dornick was originally a man. This is one of the three major gender swaps for the TV show, with the other two being Salvor Hardin and Edo Demerzel. Introducing some female characters was probably inevitable, if not necessary, since there aren't any to speak of in this part of the story, and Gal's a pretty good candidate, all things considered. He's really a blank slate. We don't learn much about him in the short period of time that he's in the story, other than him being a mathematician. Initially, the character only played a role in the first story of the first book in the series. It's an introduction to the series that was written after the fact. It's the first one you read, but the last one that was written. It was added to tie things together and to open the novel after all the short stories were collected. So the character basically functioned as a representation of the reader. Gal comes from Synax, is swept up into this situation with Harry Seldon, and you get to be introduced to the Empire's capital planet Trantor through his eyes and get an idea of who Harry Seldon is and what he's trying to do with psychohistory. If Gal was a blank slate, the next major change is that Gal definitely has a backstory. She's still from Synax, which we never really learned much about in the books, but there was no impression that it was like what we see on the show. Part of why you need a backstory for this character is that it seems pretty evident that the show's going to keep her around for a lot longer. At the end of episode 2, we saw her being put into what looked like suspended animation, and in the narration, we've heard her speaking about things that happen in the future as if she experienced them, so we can put two and two together there. Another change is that we see her get involved with Rach, who's a character that's been pulled forward in the timeline from the prequels. Rach and Demerzel aren't in the original trilogy. Both of them were introduced in Prelude to Foundation, which is also where Cleon the First comes from, and we'll come back to him in a minute. Rach is depicted mostly the same, although he is missing his thick Dalite mustache, which was basically his trademark in the books. As a child, Harry found him in a rough part of the lower levels on Trantor and adopted him. He grew up, got married, and had two kids giving Harry grandchildren. They seem to be merging that part of his story with Gale's, and the major change for him is that he didn't kill Harry on the way to Terminus. 
Actually, none of them were involved in the journey that the show has depicted as a years-long trip on a slow ship. The trip happened off-page in between stories in the books, and there's really nothing else said about it. Rach was dead by then, and it was never Harry's plan to make the trip. He died himself of old age not long after they left. In the epilogue to the prequel Forward the Foundation, it's mentioned that Gal traveled to Terminus just before Harry's death in relation to the book's version of the vault, but he wasn't involved with the initial formation of the colony. And there was a thing where Rach was briefly brainwashed to kill Harry at one point, which sounds kind of funny out of context, but the plan was stopped and it wasn't anything like what happened in the show. Plus, Rach's daughter was fully grown up by the end of the second prequel. So no slow ship, no murder, no device behind the ear, and no cryopod or whatever it is that Rach put Gale in at the end. In the beginning, she also traveled to Trantor on a jump ship, and that's quite a bit different than hyperspace travel in the books, which has been around long enough that it's just a thing that exists, and you don't have to do the whole going to sleep thing. At the beginning of the story, it's just something that people do. Unless you never go into space and you've never tried it, you don't really think too much of it. I mentioned that we didn't learn much about Synax in the books, and this whole idea of the Seer Church is completely made up for the show. There are religions and different cultures and things like that, but this one is just specifically towards Gale's story. And there's also this strange thing about her where she seems to be able to sense things before they happen. Obviously, this character didn't have anything like this in the book, and there really wasn't anything like this with the early characters. But for people who've read the entire series, it's pretty clear where this is going, so it's not completely out of the blue. The final thing with Gale is that when the Emperor was asking them why he shouldn't just kill them, it was Harry that said it would accelerate the collapse. The show switched that to Gale, which might not mean anything, or it may be something that he hadn't anticipated that might create ripple effects down the road. Beyond the stuff I've already mentioned about his death and being on the trip to Terminus in the first place, Harry as a character isn't changed much at all. In fact, some of his dialogue is pulled straight from the books, and overall what we've seen so far is consistent with how you're introduced to him there. The Emperor, on the other hand, is the last major change. As I mentioned, Cleon I was in Prelude, Demerzel was his first minister, and he did meet with Harry when he first heard about psychohistory. This was right after Harry arrived on Trantor as a young man in his 30s, though, and the ruler didn't see much use for his research at the time. It wasn't very developed yet. The Emperor in the show is a clone of that same Cleon, and there are three of them at three different ages in power together at any given time. Brother Dawn the youngest, and Brother Dusk who is the oldest, with Day sitting on the middle throne where he's the ruler with the final say. They age out and the cycle continues with Demerzel assisting in the process. Since she's a robot and doesn't age like a human, she's been involved since the beginning, outlasting them all. And there's a change with her in that Cleon never knew the male version of Demerzel was a robot in the books. The genetic dynasty is a big change in that they have absolute control over the empire. In his books, Asimov based his galactic empire on the Romans. It was basically a plutocracy where the rich and powerful ran things, and at the time that the psychohistorian story took place, the emperor was just a puppet. The show introduced the dynasty for the same reason it seems to have kept Gale in the story beyond her natural lifespan, to give a century-long story some consistency of characters that viewers can get to know and that'll be there throughout multiple seasons. I think it's too early to tell how well that will work out. There's definitely a chance that it only goes off the rails from here. Having three clones where they all have a sense of wanting to make their own mark seems better than just having one. It also puts a face on the problems of an empire that's collapsing, which may work out better than just introducing different members of the aristocracy over time. Either way, the point is that the empire is no longer effective, and those in power will make the fall worse for everyone in their unwillingness to let go of it. There's really not much there to go off of yet. The one thing we've seen that was added to the show is the conflict between Anacreon and Thespis, and of course the Starbridge attack. Brother Day took that as an opportunity to show their strength and to warn other worlds what'll happen if they go against the throne. 
Anacreon is part of the story, and this might tie into the role they play, but what we've seen so far isn't in the books at all. The last thing before I wrap it up is the Vault on Terminus. In the show, the settlers found it when they arrived on the planet, and it's this hovering sort of diamond-shaped thing. It likely serves the same purpose as it does in the book, so I won't spoil that, but as I mentioned, Gail Dornick went to the planet to set it up. It wasn't a secret, it wasn't found there, and it wasn't mystical in any way. It was just a part of the plan for Terminus and the Foundation's development. So there are a lot of changes, but if you pull back, I think you can imagine how they're drawing on things that Asimov introduced. It's still about Harry's predictions and the plan he came up with, so to me, it seems like an overreaction to say it's nothing like the original story. And I will say that it was jarring for me the first time I watched it. It takes some effort to separate what I'm seeing for what it is, instead of how it compares to my expectations. I do think changes were necessary, and even beyond the basic things that go along with adapting from one medium to the other. I think they identified some of those things, and they're making an effort to find solutions. It's still really difficult to make a great TV show, and I don't think that that's guaranteed here. The show looks great, I think it did some things well in the first two episodes, but we'll just have to wait and see. And I think that's a good place to leave it. So let me know in the comments what you're thinking about, which changes worked, which changes didn't, and what you're hoping to see going forward. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.